Um, what I'd like to do, actually, oh, I probably shouldn't do it because I has anybody um, just to, because I know that there's a lot of spatial things going on here with the colloids. Has anybody actually gone online and taken a look at the the? We have a couple sort of games that we have on online that basically sort of sh build, put together a crystal sheet and things like that. Has anybody ever has anybody done that? Does anybody even know? Maybe I should do this right now then. So there's, uh, so here's the website. The lectures are third, fifth, and seventh. But has anybody at clip, clicked on this link at this point? OK, I'd like you guys to click on this link, because it, it might help you a little bit to sort of visualize these things that we're talking about. So here's a tetrahedral sheet here. And the idea is that you can sort of see what it looks like. Click on the arrow. You can see the octahedral sheet. Click on the arrow. And basically what this is, is you can grab a hold of these guys and put them together. Okay, you can flip them, you can rearrange them. Okay, the thought, the concept is to basically put these guys together. You know, how do you get this to do what you want? Not that I can ever, ever do it. Flip. I'm out of here. Dump. Up. Up. Orient, flip, flip, flip. And there I've built my first one. OK. You guys can do this. It's OK. It's all right. If you guys really, if the world comes to an end, just click the dragon, and it'll do it for you. OK? All right. Um, but do the same thing with this, and you can sort of walk your way through these things. You know, and then you put them together so you can see how these things are put together. Okay. Um, the other thing that I'd like you guys to do, and we have this weathering. This is basically shows the sequence of weathering of this material. So you start with a vermiculite, and as you move the slider bar down, basically you're looking, we say increasing time, but in reality is this is increasing weathering. But as you slide the weathering down, you can see the changing, change in isomorphic substitution, and then the actual weathering of the material itself. Okay. So there's that one. And then the last one is the isomorphic substitution. And this gives you an idea about the charge balance. So we're going to be talking about this today. So if you literally take an ion, let's take the iron and swap it in for somebody. Oops, it's not just swapping. Come on. There we go. And we swap it in for somebody else. It'll tell you if you can't do it or you can do it. And if you can do it, it'll tell you the change in the relative charge. And I've got actually a, a slide today on lecture that you can take a look at this. So play with these things. So you have an idea about how these. You know, what we're talking about when we're talking about the crystal structure, this lattice. OK? Cool? Sort of-ish? All right, let's kill here. Go back to this. Slide OK. So last lecture was on these crystalline silicate clays, the, the phyllosilicates. OK? And this is all about soil colloids. So today we're going to talk about the other three soil colloids. And then we're going to start talking about some of the properties of these colloids. Now, when we're talking about colloids at this point, we're talking about really small things, right? Things that are smaller than one micron. And I premised the beginning of last lecture with, well, if we're talking about small things, we're really talking about those surfaces. OK? Remember me saying it's a, vo a volume of material, and it's those, everything's happening at the surfaces. OK? Well, part of that surface is all about sort of capillary action, you know, water movement and things like that. But part of that surface is about the charge. And that's what we're going to be talking about later on in today's lecture. First, let's finish about talking about what these colloids are. And the first one we're going to talk about is non-crystalline uh, non silicates. Phylo means sheet. So these are phyllosilicates. So when I say phyllosilicates here, I, miss, I misspoke. These are still silicates, the same ingredients that are in these, but the way they're formed is very different. These are basically volcanic products. Okay? They're coming from volcanic ash. And you can imagine, as this magma is cooled slowly, I'm going to be able to form large crystals. 
But if it's a mag it's, if it's a magma event that's actually coming becoming ejecta, or it's coming up very quickly and cooling very quickly, the regular crystal structure that you get with the phyllosilicates is not going to happen. But I am still going to get the same ingredients. I'm basically cooking it at a different temperature, sort of. Okay. So the parent material is basically the same, but the nature of the parent material is different. It's composed largely of vitric or glassy materials carrying, containing various amounts of aluminum and silica, and it lacks the well-defined crystals that you're going to get from these slower cooled environments. Okay. Allophanes and emogalites are the common early stage residual weathering products of this stuff, but it's basically this glass and these poorly ordered, ordered structure, but it's basically just weathering out and it goes into these allophanes and emogalites. The allophanes form inside the glass fragments, okay, where the silicon concentrations and the pH are fairly high, and they have a characteristically sort of spheroidal shape. And I'll show you some pictures of these in a moment. The emogalite tends to form on the exterior okay, of these fragments, and they're basically they're in an environment where there's lower pHs and lower concentrations of silicate, and they tend to have sort of like a thread-like Here's some pictures of it. Here's the allophane, sort of the spheroidal stuff that's forming inside. Here's the emogalite. Okay. These are, this is a very small, so this is, this is two microns right here to give you a scale. Okay. This is an entire particle. This is these amorphous materials. This, you, can, you can imagine that being a, you know, ejecta of volcanic material, right? Okay. There's the scale. That's 10 microns. I also put in here, uh, this is uh, uh, vermiculite and this is smectite to give you a sort of a scale, a sort of a, 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 a the comparison, okay? These are these phyllosilicates, okay? These are these amorphous materials. So you can see that they're, they physically look different. They're not just morphologically, they physically look different. Okay, the next one is iron and uh, aluminum oxides. We call these susquioxides, okay? They're dominantly gibbsite, which is the aluminum oxide, and gertite, which is the iron oxide, okay? They're found in many, many soils. I mean, they find, we find them around here. We find them basically everywhere. Okay? They're especially important in highly weathered soils in the warm, humid tropics. Okay, why? Well, these guys tend to be the end products of weathering, and so we find a lot of them. Now, you guys remember me take show, actually, next slide. Remember me showing you slides of this stuff. These are those oxisols. The reds that we're seeing in here are due to these gertite iron oxide types. Not strictly gertite, but these iron oxides. It's that red. It's the rust. Okay? Uh, they consist mainly of either iron or aluminum atoms attached with or coordinated with oxygen atoms. Okay? Um, this oxygen is often associated with a proton to make hydroxyl groups. And that's going to be that term right there, that's going to become more important later in this lecture. So keep that in mind. Okay? Um, some, such as the gibbsite and gertite, form crystalline sheets. They can, in fact, form sheets. Um, and you saw that in that one module that I showed online. You know, when you guys go click on it, okay, how the, the two tetrahedral sheets sort of s separate off and the octahedral sheet is left behind. Okay. Um, and they also can form amorphous coatings. You've seen these amorphous coatings. These are those redox features that we saw when we were up at Mount Pleasant. Okay. Now, because of the, and this is where this hydroxyl component comes in important, because of the surface plane of the, of the covalence, be, basically because of where these oxygens are, they're exposed to the soil solution. They're exposed to the soil They're not actually attached to another crystalline sheet. Because of that, these protons are bonding. Now, you guys remember, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier on when we were talking about these structures, when I was talking about the building blocks. But um, I started by drawing a, a you know, an octahedral sheet here, okay, and it has a couple more coming out, okay. But this guy is not going to live like this in solution because this is going to be a charged particle, right? Okay, and if it's a charged particle, all of these oxygens that are out here are going to have a proton attached to them, okay. Now, I could have a larger sheet that keeps going on out here, but all of the oxygens that are at the edge are exposed to that soil solution, and they're going to have a proton attached to it, okay? Because they're going to they want to balance that charge, okay? Now, because of this proton in here, remember me saying earlier that you know these charges with isomorphic substitution they tend to have a net negative charge, 
But because this proton is attaching to this hydroxide, these susquioxides actually tend to have an anion attraction because they're, in a sense, positively charged. Now, the positive charge is coming because a proton is attaching to them. It's not part of the crystal. Okay? But it's a positive charge, which means negatively charged ions are going to be attracted to this particle. Does that make sense? Keep that in mind, because we are going to be talking about it later on. <coughs> okay, this is what these things look like. Here's a gibbsite, and there's a girtite. Actually, pretty, actually very pretty. This is, uh, a, these are related to fool's gold. Does anybody know fool's gold, iron pyrite? Okay, very similar. Okay, they can form rather large structures, but you know these are variants of the of of gibbsite and girtite. Okay, um, they also have these amorphous coatings, and these should be familiar with, to you guys. This is what you guys saw. I mean, I've so showed you this slide before, but this is what we saw down at the bottom of Mount Pleasant, or that valley in Mount Pleasant, right? Okay, iron accumulations, amorphous, not crystalline. Okay, the next calloid. These are organic, humic cal calloids, organic molecules, okay? They're nearly, they're important in nearly all soils. Organic matter is really important for a lot of reasons, okay? They are not mineral and they're not crystalline. I mean, they're organic, okay? They consist primarily of long convoluted, can anybody say that? Con con convoluted, that's the word. They consist of long convoluted chains and rings of carbon structure, okay, that are bonded with hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, as well as other nutrients. Or they are very high capacity to absorb water, uh, and they have high amounts of both those positive charges as well as those negative charges, okay, though their permanent charge is still always negative. The net negative charge is, net, is negative, okay? Now, this is, again, that molecule that I showed you yesterday, uh, or Monday, this is, no, this, is, this is not a real molecule. This is just a model of an organic molecule. But you can see how complex it is. And what's important here is all these hydroxyl groups that are in here that are exposed out into the soil solution. They behave very similarly to those hydroxyls, or those OHs, that are on the susquioxides. And this is where, depending upon what the pH is of the soil, sy the soil system, this is where you potentially will have anions attracted and held in from the solution on the soil. Okay? Now, scale here, this is an organic molecule. Okay? Here's two microns. So basically half of that is basically colloidal size. And this is obviously larger than colloidal size. But if you look at the internal structure in this, we're definitely at the one micron size. Okay? So yes, while the particle itself may be in fact much larger than colloidal size, it is, in fact, still reacting with the colloidal material. And in reality, this is just a very large piece. This stuff can be degraded and become re really small. So it's, in fact, really is colloidal material. OK? Questions so far? Cool. All right. So we have this very large, complex organic molecule. In a sense, it's very important because of the surface area. But in a sense, part of why it's so important is because of these things that are sticking out into the soil solution. Okay? We have carboxylic groups here, the COOH. We have phenolic groups, the ring structure with the OH. And we have hydroxyl groups, basically the OH. Okay? All of these OHs, all of these Os, I should say, these oxygens, can react with the proton and change the charge of the entire molecule. All right, so if this is a high pH or a low pH, that proton may or may not be there. If it's a high pH, this proton's not going to be there. And in essence, it's going to create this give this molecule a more negative charge. In low pH, the proton is going to be there, and it's going to give the molecule a more positive charge. Does that make sense? So the charge on these hydroxyls are pH dependent. OK. So those are the four types of phyllosilicates. We have, uh, of the, ugh, I keep saying this. These are the four types of colloids. The first one is the crystalline phyllosilicates. The second one is those amorphous ones. The third is the susquioxides. And the last one is the organic. OK? Cool. Take a deep breath. You made it through that component. Any kind of questions? Go. How is this last molecule related to like lignin and carbohydrates? Um, 
I'm going to, I'll answer the question, but I want to defer most of that question until we start talking about organic matter. So the, the question is, you know, how does this molecule or any one of these molecules, that's why I said that this is a, a, a model system. This is, this, there's no such thing as, there's no organic molecule that looks like this. This is just sort of saying, okay, these are all the variants that you have on them. Different type of organic molecules have different structural arrangements in them and different c compositions. But they all, to a certain extent, have these carboxyl or these hydroxyl groups sticking out of them. And at this point, that's what's important. Now, the reality is what's, when we start talking about decomposition, that's when structure starts becoming important. But the reality is even there, it's less structure and more availability that makes it imp decomposition important. Okay, structure is going to have a huge role on as it decomposes, what is it going to be releasing? It's availability that's really going to control, going to control how fast or where it's decomposed. All right, uh, let's skip this slide. All right, so I've been talking about charge. Let's start talking about it a little bit more. Okay, now. We have this permanent charge that's associated due to isomorphic substitution in the phyllosilicates. We also have a permanent charge that's due to the structural arrangement of the organic matter. We have a permanent charge that's associated with the structural components of the susquioxides oxides as well as those amorphous materials. It's permanent. It's part of the structure. It will not change until it's either been decomposed or weathered. Okay? You get both negative and positive charges with those structures, but with the file silicates and with all of them, with the exception of the amorphous guys, they are predominantly negative. The structural charge is predominantly negative, okay, which means that that magnet, that colloid, is going to be attractive to positively charged ions. Okay? Now, we also have a variable, or we call it a pH-dependent charge. This is both negative and positive as well. It's primarily associated with those hydroxyl groups, okay? And it's going to change based on the pH, and it is a big source of charge when you're looking at molecules that have lots of hydroxyls that are exposed. Humic material, iron oxides, iron aluminum oxides, and some, uh, and the aliphanes, and, and some of those phyllosilicates. Now, this is actually a really important word here, some. Because some of these phyllosilicates, they don't have a lot of those hydroxyls sticking out. And if they don't have a lot of them sticking out, they're not going to be very susceptible to pH change. On the other hand, some of those phyllosilicates do, in fact, have a lot of hydroxyls, hydroxyls sticking out into the soil solution. And as a result, they are more susceptible to pH change. OK? Questions? Okay, phyllosilicate is, well, actually, this is a phyllosilicate right here. Phyllosilicate is a sheet silicate. Silicate is the building block, and that's a t tetrahedral and octahedral sheet being built. Okay, so here is, you're looking at the tetrahedral component of it. No, these are octahedral components of it, sorry. Okay, so you're looking at that inner ring. Now, this would be binding to another structure, of a tetrahedral sheet on that side and a tetrahedral sheet in here. Okay. The, but they're basically those sheet, they're crystals, they're those long crystals, okay? So is the phyllosilicate the, just the octahedral or the tetrahedral? No, 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 the whole the thing, yeah, phyllo being sheets, being the layers. So phyllo, sheet, silicates, silicates being the building block, okay. okay? All right, so let's make the, I want to make this point here of absorption versus absorption, okay? Adsorption is surface bonding. Absorption is actually the internal structure. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So examples here, this is surface bonding. I have my phyllosilicate here, and these cations are all being attracted and binding at the surface. They're not actually part of the structure. Here is isomorphic substitution, where the ion, the cation, is basically part of the internal structure. This is absorption versus abs uh, adsorption versus absorption. OK. Just a jargon, just because I'm going to be throwing this at you a lot. Cations versus anions.
cations are the positively charged ions, anions are the negatively charged ions, and it has to do with that shell uh, satisfying the shell. You guys remember the shells, the electron rings? Okay. So if I'm basically from here over to satisfy, to make my shell eight, I basically have to get rid of an electron, so I have a positive charge. Okay. I, from five over, it's easier to add electrons or gain electrons to satisfy that eight orbital, and so as a result, I have a negative charge. Okay. Just the reality, the gist of this is, Cations are the positively charged ones, anions are the negatively charged ones. Okay, let's start with the structural. Let's start with the permanent pH, okay, or the permanent charge. Okay, here are the different minerals that are out there. We're basically looking at le less, less weathered material to more weathered material. Okay, so as I start weathering these products, I'm going to start pulling out the impurities. Does that make sense? It shouldn't, but does it? Think about this. You guys remember the pie chart? The content will cross the ingredients that the magma is creating. Something looks like this. You know, I've got oxygen over here, aluminum, iron, magnesium, and all the everything else. Okay, so my crystals are going to be predominantly oxygen, silica, aluminum, right? Silicon, sorry, I keep saying that. Okay. As they get weathered, everything's going to be pulled out, right? But what is actually going to be put back, if, it, if it's going to be put back? The weathering process, and it's, it seems strange, but the weathering process is actually a purification process. Because these things are preferentially going to be used up outside of the crystal structure. A lot of these are nutrients. A lot of these can be leached from the system. And so as a result, as these things weather more and more and more, my crystals, in a sense, are going to become purer and purer and purer. Does that make sense? OK. Now, if we take a look at this chart here, we're basically looking at least weathered to most weathered. In the magma process, as these crystals are forming, I'm starting to see isomorphic substitution. The impurities are making their way in there. Now, I have those impurities coming in with secondary weathering and forming these secondary minerals at the surface as well. But with that isomorphic substitution, I get a percentage of charge change. Okay? These are the octahedral sheets, and these are the tetrahedral sheets. These are the formulas for how much iron or aluminum or whatever is in those the core of that sheet. Here's the oxygen, or actually here's the coordinating oxygen that goes with these octahedral and tetrahedral sheets. You look down here, my octahedral sheet in the chloride has magnesium iron in it, and my tetrahedral sheet has uh, silicon, iron, and aluminum in it. So they're impure. And so, impure. They have p impurity issues. Okay, so as a result, if we look at their charge, they're not balanced. Charge per formula, basically they're gonna have a negative charge. That's that negative charge, that net negative charge. Okay, as these things get weathered, you'll notice initially these guys start weathering out, and I start, when I get up to here at kaolinite, my octahedral sheet is basically, the core is basically only aluminum, the tetrahedral is only silica, matched with the oxygen, and my charge formula is zero. So as I get more and more weathered, my net negative charge actually decreases, becomes more neutral. Does that make sense? And this is all due to that isomorphic substitution. The same, in a sense, is true with these. This is an organic molecule, another one of those dummy. This is not a real molecule. Okay? But if you look at this, you can see the complexity of it, and you can see the structural charges that are associated with this. Look, here, I mean, here's an OH group right here. Here's a couple of carboxylic groups. That's not a carboxylic. This is, I guess, there's a phenolic group. Carboxylic, where can I, oh, here's a carbo, I'm missing the carboxylic groups for whatever reason. The esters in the bottom. Oh, right here. Yeah. OK. Hold on, question up here, go. You sure? Yeah. OK, question. 
Chemical or physically weathered, but chemical weather is what's driving this. Physical weathering, so the question was, uh, when I say weathered, what do I actually mean? In this scenario, we're really talking about chemically weathered material, okay? I really have to chemically alter this. Now, physical weathering is gonna make it easier for chemical weathering to occur, but physical weathering is not actually gonna change the structure, it's just gonna make it smaller. Does that make sense? Yeah, go. Isomorphic substitution can happen in two ways. One is it actually literally is happening as this, these things are cooling. Okay, I'm not getting a perfect crystal, something substituting for it. And secondarily, when it comes up to the surface, these materials can, these materials in here can swap out, literally changing the crystal. Okay, I'm, remember when we talked about the, the um, theory two for a fragile pan formation? Okay, you guys remember for the fragile pans up in Mount Pleasant? There was two theories. One theory was that we're basically looking at a dewatering event, making these fragile pans really dense. The second theory was that the silts, caps, are basically weathering, and the, the water is basically moving these weathered products down into the dense zone where they're then forming secondary crystals. Basically, the, the thought here is I'm making rock candy. Does that make sense? Have you guys made rock candy? You know, you, you, just, you have to put water, uh, sugar in warm water and let it sort of go into, you know, dissolve. And then you put a sh string in there and you let it cool. Okay, and basically the crystals will form on the string and you create a rock candy. Okay, well the same thing is in essence happening here. Go. Is isomorphic substitution a form of weathering? Yeah, yeah, I think isomorphic, yeah, you could think of isomorphic substitution as a form of weathering. It's a form of modification which is just weathering. I'm modifying my crystal by substituting one ion for another ion. Okay? Go. In these tightly packed layers, how is it? How is it possible for it? You gotta imagine the size of water versus these crystals. I mean, yeah, I'm looking at one colloid, you know, one, one micron of material, but water, you know, it's, and it's, at the, it's happening at the edges, and these, these things weather depending on how they're weathering, if they're unzipping or they're unsandwiching. You know, you got stuff cutting in there. Okay, mostly, I, you would certainly imagine most of the isomorphic substitution is really happening at the edges because that's where things are exposed. But once that starts unzipping, you can start getting things farther in. Go. Is isomorphic substitution the, the addition of impurities or making it more pure by weathering? Isomorphic substitution is the swapping of the ions. Okay. In some scenarios, it's making it more impure, and in some scenarios, it's actually purifying it. The purification and purification, probably not the right term. But does that make sense to everybody? Yes? Questions? OK. So OK. So in this is, that's, the, that's the source of that permanent charge. And it will not change until that material has weathered away or been decomposed. Got it? All right. The next thing then is now let's talk about that variable charge, that pH dependent charge. And that is associated with that hydroxyl group. Okay, it can be both negative and positive. It's a hydroxyl group, and it's a source of that charge on the humic materials, the oxide materials, allophanes, and some of these phyllosilicates. Okay, so it's variable. Okay, here is an, I've shown all of these pictures. Okay, but basically it's these hydroxyl groups that are sticking off. Okay, wherever they happen to be. Here's the kaolinite. You have hydroxyl groups up on this sheet right here. Here's some oxide. You have hydroxyl groups on both sides. Here's the organic molecule. You have hydroxyl groups all over the place. Okay, here is that edge, okay? So imagine I'm taking a line and I'm just showing the edge right there. I'm cutting it right where that oxygen is. Here's the oxygen, okay? So this C represents the rest of that organic molecule, okay? This aluminum basically represents the rest of this gibbsite, okay? I'm drawing a line right where that oxygen is, so that's basically the edge. This side of that line is the soil solution. This side of the line is the structure. Okay, so if I start changing the pH of that soil solution, so I start changing this side of the molecule, okay, of this side of the, of the, of the volume, okay, and I b start basically increasing the pH. If I start increasing the pH, I'm going to start adding hydroxyl molecules to the soil solution. I have a hydroxyl here, and I have a hydroxyl here. This hydroxyl is going to go in, and if I keep adding these, pro these hyd hydroxyl units, what's going to happen is this Hydroxyl is going to bind with that proton and make water. 
And it's going to pull it off and make water. And the result is that my molecule now has a negative charge. It's become more negative by adding hydroxide. Does that make sense? Questions? All right, let's turn the scenario around. Basically the same graphs that you, see, you saw before, but in this scenario, rather than want adding hydroxide, I'm going to start lowering the pH. I'm going to start adding protons. Okay? Now, this has a negative charge here. The proton is going to react and bind with that negative charge. And as a result, I'm going to end up with a positive charge associated with my structure. Now, I change the pH, and this will totally change. But at this pH, where I've added the protons, at this pH, this molecule now has a positive charge associated with it. And that positive charge can hold on to negatively charged ions that are in solution here, as this can as this negatively charged ion that's here, when I have high pHs, can hold on to more positively charged ions. So it's variable. It's pH variable. So the charge associated with this colloid has to do with the pH. Go. When OK, so the question was, um, if we have a, co a colloid or a particle that's basically binding these cations or anions, and the system goes dry, what happens to those ions? Well, as long as they're bound to this colloid, they will stay in solution. But all the ions, uh, they'll stay in the soil, the soil volume. But all the ions that were in solution will go with the water. Does that make sense? And so this is, you see this a lot with the sort of the see a lot. You see it a lot everywhere. But um, this is really a big effect when you start going out west and you start seeing the salt buildups and stuff like that. No, that's the water moving up. Okay? The salts are not actually being held, but the water itself is leaving because of evaporation and the salts are left behind. But it's a very similar type of go. The question was, is it a general rule, as the pHs go high, are the charges more positive on the soils? And the general, or negative. negative. So increasing negative, I'm going to increase my ch negative charge. If I drop, if I, if I increase the hydroxide, pH goes up, I'm going to get a more negative charge. That is a general, and the other way around. Yes, it is a general trend. Okay? But the reality is, you have to have the types of materials that are pH variable. OK? Let's go back to this slide right here. OK? No, not this slide. Let's go actually to the next slide. All of these molecules, all these colloids, are pH variable. But if they have more or less hydroxide, they're going to be more or less pH variable. So it's really dependent. That charge variability is really dependent upon that hydroxyl being exposed. Okay? You can certainly imagine a phyllosilicate right here. It has a lot of hydroxyls. But if those hydroxyls are actually interior to the structure, they're not exposed to the soil solution. And if they're not exposed to the soil solution, they're not going to be pH dependent because they can't react with the hydroxide or the proton moving into the system. They will only have hydroxyl units exposed at the edge. Okay? And yes, they'll be pH dependent charged right there, but considering the rest of this large structure, I mean, these are really large structures relative to this edge, really small effect. It's not until you get a really large surface area of hydroxyls that is exposed that you're going to start getting really large pH dependent charges. OK? Does that make sense? OK. Any questions on this? OK. 
the take home point, and your question basically spoke to this, the charge is only associated, this pH dependent charge is only associated with those hydroxyl groups. And if they're not exposed, you're not going to get, you're not going to get that pH dependent charge. Now with the phyllosilicates, the reality is, yes, you have some hydroxyls at the edges. But the reality is with the phyllosilicates, you're only going to get it really on the one-to-one -one phyllosilicates because it's that octahedral sheet. Remember the one-to-ones? Okay, versus a two-to-one versus a two-to-one-to-one. -one. Here's my tetrahedral sheet, my octahedral sheet underneath it. They're being bound by those oxygens in here, okay? If I don't have another tetrahedral sheet down here, these oxygens are all going to be exposed. But if I do have a tetrahedral sheet here, these oxygens are no longer exposed, and so they're not subject to pH-dependent charge. I still have some on the edges, but not, in the, not on the, the vast majority of the surface area. Go. They do, but because of the way they're bound together, that oxygen is not, um, it's not reactive to the, the pH changes. Cool? Good so far? OK. Now the cool thing here is, if you think about this, Depending upon the structural arrangement, we're looking at all these different colloids, but, ten, but depending upon that structural arrangement, these colloids, some of them are going to be predominantly permanent charge, some of them are going to be predominantly pH dependent charge, and some of them are going to be a mix. Okay? So what we have here is we have a humic material and a smectite, a phyllosilicate and an organic molecule. Okay? And we're looking at the bottom here is we're looking at pH changes from 4 to 8. So the pH is increasing this way, okay? And this is a measurement of its cation exchange capacity, i.e., how much cations it can hold on to it, okay? Now, no anion measurement here. This is just cation, okay? As the pH increases, I'm increasing the hydroxy, hydroxy. I'm increasing the hydroxyl molecules in my soil solution. If that's the case, those hydroxyl molecules are going to bind and pull off that proton that's on the hydroxyl that's part of the structure. Okay, so as it goes up, I'm going to be pulling that off, which means I'm going to get more negative charge on my structures. Okay, here's my protons being pulled off of my humic material, and look what happens to the CEC, the ability of the humic materials to hang on to positively charged ions. It's getting more and more negative, so as a result, it's ability to hold on to the cations increases. Does that make sense? As I go this way with the humic material, my capacity increases because my humic material is getting more and more negative. Right? Now let's look at the smectite on the other hand. Smectite, two to one mineral. Basically flat, flat line until I get fairly high pHs where I'll get a slight pH boost on my ability to hang on to cations. But it's nothing like that. And the reality is here, smectites do have those hydroxyls exposed, but they don't have the abundance that it is that are exposed in the organic molecule. Does that make sense? Questions? Go. What's the ratio for smectite? The ratio for smectite. Uh, it's two to one. I don't know off the top of my head. But we can go back to smectite. Yeah, Let's look. Um, you want marillinite. It's basically right here. So the ratio is a charge formula right down here. Is that what you were asking? I was just asking the two to one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a two to one. <laughs> Any other questions on this? Do we feel comfortable with this? OK, I am homework. And I'm not going to grade you on this, but this is your homework. Okay, I need you guys, I need you, I need you, I, I really need you guys to take a look at those three online little game things, okay? I want you to build those structures. I want you to see how these structures are put together. 
I also want you to take a look at how these things change. As I start playing, As I start playing with weathering, you know, as I mar start moving through that weathering, what am I looking at structurally? How are these structures changing? And then finally, I want you to play with that isomorphic substitution. Where do these things isomorphically substitute? And when they substitute, what are they going to do charge-wise? Where is that substitution to? That's actually really important. Remember us talking about the smectites versus the vermiculites? and the expansive nature of them, if that isomorphic substitution is in the octahedral sheet versus the tetrahedral sheet, I'm going to have a stronger attraction to things that are in the soil solution. The smectites, the isomorphic substitution is in the octahedral sheet. And so as a result, it will expand more because it has less of an attraction. It's not holding. It's, I mean, it's a weaker magnet in essence. OK? All right. You guys survived another lecture. OK? We have one more lecture on colloids. OK? Take a look at it before you get in. We're gonna f it's, it's a cool lecture, I think. Um, I expect you guys to have taken a look at these things be before you come to the next lecture. OK? All right? All right. We are going out to the field today, whether it rains or not. Otherwise, guys, be free.